This is the market in Dinslaken Loberg on the Rhine River, near the Dutch border. It's a former coal mining community, and the locals are familiar with one another. It's easy to strike up a conversation. For months now, much of the talk has been about local Muslim boys who have gone to fight in the Middle East. At least 12 young men from Loberg are known to have joined Islamic State. They are thought to be fighting now in Syria. This man says he's heard the youngsters are all drug addicts from problem families who got into a lot of trouble as boys. Some have returned from the conflict. I ask him if he's frightened. He tells me he's concerned for his family. This woman says none of the young men work. They come from dysfunctional homes. They join up because they don't have any prospects for the future, she says. So they just go and do what they want. I asked this man what Germany should do with returning Muslim fighters. His answer? Deport them. We travel to the edge of town to meet a young man who does not want to be identified. We call him Hakan. He says he has information about the IS fighters from Dinslaken Loberg and admits he almost went to fight in Syria himself. Hakan is willing to tell us his story, but he's afraid of attracting the attention of Germany's domestic intelligence service. I asked him how he first got involved with Muslim fundamentalists and potential fighters. It was a couple of years ago. They all know each other anyway. One of them came to speak, and he was always saying great things about Islam and everything. He told us that we pay lip service to Islam, but don't put it into practice. We didn't say our prayers. On the contrary, we were out drinking every weekend. When he came, I was already thinking what a mess I was making of my life. So I thought, yes, this is a chance to do something about it. To do something for the next life. I'd been fired from my job anyway. So I thought I would just go over there and make a few contacts. Maybe find a bit of work later. Just to get off the streets somehow. A prospect for the future. Something like that. I asked Hakan to describe how the man who came to talk to them approached the subject of joining the conflict in Syria. There were a lot of videos showing what the Assad regime was doing there, what it was doing to all the Muslims. There were videos showing children being murdered or women's bellies being slit open, that kind of thing. And they said things like, how can Muslims like us just sit at home and watch when this is happening to our children? Things like that. At some point you get brainwashed. I ask him if the men hand-picked people to go and fight. They took people aside and they spoke to them in private. They were looking for people who had nothing more to lose. No job, no money. They were the ones they thought they could work with. They would say to some people, you are the one, you are a martyr, you are a jihadi warrior, 40 virgins will await you in heaven. Things like that. The young men who eventually signed up, they loved all that. They were excited about being given a gun to shoot with. Some of them were guys you would never have expected to do something like that. I was on the verge of going too. It was two days before I was due to fly out and I was still deciding whether or not to go. At one point I was sure that I would have left Germany within the next two days. The coal mine used to be the biggest employer among the 6,000 residents of Loberg. Now the former mine is a tourist attraction. When the Loberg pit was still active, it provided training and apprenticeships for 300 young people a year, many of them the children of original guest workers from Turkey. Back then, when everyone had a job, it didn't matter at the mine whether people had Turkish or German names. But the mine closed in 2005, and almost from one day to the next, a quarter of the area's young people were jobless. 
extremists recognized a hunting ground for young fighters. Turhan Tunsel and Errol Tonk work for the local integration office. They say the Salafist fundamentalists are a problem because they recruit jihadis and because they are anti-integration in general. Turhan tells me they didn't realize the scale of the problem at first. They thought the group was just local youngsters socializing. They only realized later that they were fundamentalists who wanted to go and fight in Syria. Turhan and his colleagues are supposed to represent the interests of migrants in the community. But now their time is taken up with dealing with the spread of Salafism and recruitment for Islamic State. The two integration workers are gathering signatures for a petition to protest what they're calling violent Salafism. They want to offer young people an alternative to extremism with leisure and sport activities and job interview training. Turhan and Errol tell me their outreach work is important because it can give young people hope for the future. Organizing activities with them and for them shows that someone is concerned about them and gives them some stability in life. Education, training, work, that's what's important for young people, they tell me. They are also concerned about how to reintegrate jihadis if and when they return from Syria. Errol tells me the main thing is to help them find their feet, to become positive rather than negative role models for young people. That way their experiences in conflict zones can be used as a warning to others not to get involved. We are back with our informer, Hakan. He still has regular contact with fighters in Syria. He says friends who went to Syria to fight are still friends no matter what. I ask him what they say about their lives in Syria. They lived in a neighborhood that used to be reserved for the rich, but they've all fled because of the war. They say it's like a holiday, except when they have to go out and fight. They imagined they would just get a gun and go off to war, but they had to undergo training before they could go out and fight. Military training? Basic training, yes, but it was sick, really sick. They were beaten and everything. It really frightened them. I ask Hakan what they say about the war, their experience of fighting. They told me about Philip, before he blew himself up. He'd been shot in the chin and spent three months more or less in a coma. He couldn't do anything to help the people out there anymore. What was he supposed to do? He could hardly hold a gun anymore. He couldn't even eat. So they gave him a bomb and sent him into a crowd to blow himself up. They don't care whether innocent people die in a blast or not. Yeah, hello, Manfred Götzke from the Deutschen Welle. Two weeks later, we arranged to meet Hakan again. He seems nervous on the phone. He tells me he's had a visit from the police and his wife has been questioned about IS fighters. Hakan is scared of the police and of the Secret Service. We arranged to meet at a hotel in Dinslaken. Hakan tells me he has news from the Loberg jihadis. I heard that two of them have been shot and injured. I couldn't talk about it last time we met. It was two who were not usually with ISIS. They are involved with al-Nusra, that's al-Qaeda in Syria. What IS is doing has nothing to do with Islam anymore, nothing at all. And that's why a lot of the fighters want to come home. The problem is that even if they manage to get away, to escape IS, they will still be on the IS hit list. I'm sure of that. I ask Hakan what returning fighters plan to do. Will they give themselves up to the authorities? I don't want to say too much about that, because they will just have to see when they get here. Can we stop filming now? We end the interview. Hakan leaves the hotel first. When we leave a short time later, we notice a police car parked on the corner of the street. Back at the closed-down mine in Loberg, a new leisure park is being opened. The miners' male voice choir is there, along with the local transport minister and the mayor. Integration worker Turhan Tunsel is at the event, collecting signatures for his anti-Salafist petition. It's just a gesture. The petition will not have any legal force. But it sends a message many agree with. This man says that what's happening is not the true face of Islam. 
He says all the Turkish, Arab and other Muslims he knows are all peace-loving, nice and kind. Turhan knows practically everyone in Loberg. And almost everyone he approaches is happy to sign the petition. Tirhan tells me his campaign against Salafist extremism has united people from different organizations and associations which might not otherwise have come together. At the leisure park opening, the local imam takes the stage. He speaks out against radical Salafism too. The imam says they claim to be acting in the name of religion. But the crimes they commit show Allah that they do not understand a word. We hope that everyone in Germany will support us in our fight against hatred and injustice. Walking by the canal, Hakan shows us where he and his friends used to hang out. We used to come here a long time ago. We had barbecues, we sat around a little campfire in the evenings. I ask him if he thinks his friends would rather be here than in Syria. I think five members of the Loberg Brigade would come back if they could. Hakan says he doesn't understand how everything has gotten so out of hand. It's not jihad anymore. What have we done? We nearly believed it was holy war. Now I thank God for keeping me here and keeping me safe. <laughs>